All right, looks like uh, it's time to get going. We have a quorum. So if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, could I have uh, a motion to approve the prior minutes? Carol moves, seconded by Jordan. Is there any discussion? Additions, modifications? Seeing none. All those? Of course. Seth. Ellen. Ellen? Yes. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I am well. Uh, I'm right back to my old uh, tricks here about forgetting that we have people on the phone. And I, and I just got started. Bear with me. Yes, I am alone. I'm in my office all by myself. Thank you, Ellen. No one else. Um, yes, so... Um, all those in favor of the approval of the minutes signify so by raising your right hand. We all have to vote, Carl, not just them. Every single person. It's all your fault, Carol. I'm here tonight. <laughs> this isn't me. <laughs> okay, we have to approve uh, everything by roll call vote. Pat, would you please call the roll? Yes. 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 Thank you, Pat. It's unanimous. Um, the <coughs> next item on the agenda um, concerns both our previous uh, experience with Pat, uh, and we have uh, Matt Chevenel here uh, on the phone as well. Uh, if we have uh, any questions um, about training, uh, I hope everybody's had an opportunity to not only hear the presentation that Pat gave, but uh, the material that she handed out it was rather exhaustive, uh, although I'm sure it, uh, Matt could easily uh, fill in any spaces of a particularity that uh, any individual board members may have. So here's an opportunity to um, question Matt. Uh, about training and the responsibilities uh, of being a budget committee member. Well, I, I think we've probably got a pretty well uh, um, educated and knowledgeable board at this point, um, comparative to uh, perhaps some previous years. So, um, uh, we will move on with uh, our financial update. Uh, the 2019-2020 end of year review. 
the 2020-2021 current status and the outlook. And uh, uh, Matt Chevenel, you uh, have the floor to uh, illuminate all of us relative to the financial conditions of the district as they presently stand. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Moore. I appreciate it. Um, what I tried to do is hopefully you have the full colored copies. Um, this is all posted online. And so me being partially colorblind here, I'm seeing red, green, yellow, blue, orange, and that's about it. Those are my, those are my different categories. And when I was speaking with Pat, uh, she conveyed that, that Chuck wanted to to know kind of, you know, what, what was the, um, what were the implications of ending the school year early, having the break in mid-March, and basically what was the, uh, the effect of COVID on the 1920 budget. So I tried to kind of put that into different categories. So if you look at the, the, the first line, number one, COVID planning and supplies. Um, this is basically made out of around $25,000 worth of wages and the rest of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, like the uh, Clorox T360 sprayers that we had purchased. And the, the, the salaries basically with COVID in March, we uh, started a probably around 10 different teams ranging from curriculum to remote instruction to transportation to athletics uh, uh, and, uh, you know, to infrastructure, what we could do to safeguard, you know, the people and the staff and the kids. And, you know, it was in, you remember this, this, this budget ended uh, June 30, 2020. So we were working on that, and we had the ability to make some purchases early on that we thought were were necessary. There were probably, I would say, a hundred people working on ten different committees at that time to try and ascertain what the best plan of action and what we should be doing to begin the school year and what we should be doing to kind of end out the school year. You know, as you know, you know, if anybody tried to to um, acquire any sort of, you know, disinfectant spray or anything like that around that period of time, there was a massive shortage of that type of equipment and supplies. So we really kind of had to dig deep at the end of the, the school year to get stuff on board. And so we had recommendations basically from that committee that we would buy plastic dividers, we would buy um, spraying machines that could, they were electrostatic sprayers. Uh, we bought, I believe, 10 of them. It was around $40,000. And each custodian in the evening uh, we changed their hours of operations from 3 to 11 to 3 to 1 a.m. So we put them on a four-day-a-week, 40-hour schedule. This is the second shift. So they could spray and sanitize all the classrooms and spaces in each building. You know, one custodian can handle 18,000 square feet in an hour with the sprayer. You know, we found out that that is really an ideal condition but what it does what the electrostatic sprayers do is they uh, and i know i'm going off topic but it's, it's all going to come around in the end anyway and what it does is it adheres to both the surface areas and because it's electrostatic it adheres to surface underneath desks also underneath chairs so any place there's a surface it'll cling to it and within 10 minutes you, the room is safe for use. And by the following morning, when people come in, 
everything is is sprayed and disinfected and whatnot. So that was part of our plan as far as the infrastructure technology task force that I led uh, to take care of, you know, the sanitization of all the buildings and everything like that. So through the end of June 30, we had spent probably around 73510 You see that on, I'm on page two right now. Uh, you can see that in, in red. Uh, so I wanted to bring that up first. You can see our surplus on page one is four million seven seventy two two eighty two. Um, that is up from last year. Last year it was probably three point well it was three million one hundred and seventy two thousand dollars and a few hundred dollars. So that's up around a million and a half. So instead of spending our customary customary ninety eight percent of the budget, we spent around ninety four percent of the budget. And that's basically, you know, uh, because of because of COVID and lacking lack of, of staff and other things that I'm going to go through in the green section. So that was significant in that that four million seven seventy two two eighty two, which was the nineteen twenty surplus or unassigned fund balance, as we call it, <clears throat> went back to reduce the tax bill. Um, that you're getting this year. You're, I don't know if the December bills are out yet or not. And I, I don't want to say too much because the, the town council has a 10-day right of rescission on the rate. And I spoke with Paul McCallie last week and got the you know forms from DRA, and I have access to the forms from DRA through their online portal. And I just want to let everybody know that the school portion of the tax rate for this coming year went down 39 cents a thousand. So that means on a $300,000 house, your school portion of your tax rate is going down $120. So they say taxes never go down. Well, this year they did, and in part because of the increased amount of surplus. We didn't have that much on the revenue side, but that ties into it, and that that kind of sums it up to four million seven seventy two. So the school portion of the rate went down thirty nine cents, and it was in part due to this uh, surplus that we acquired at the end of two thousand twenty. Now, in the in the green section. <clears throat> You know, a lot of these are going to be self-evident and they're going to make a lot of sense, common sense wise. You know, when you have a lack of staff, when you're not operating a building full bore, when you're not having all your teachers in all the time, every day, and you kind of go to a hybrid remote model, <clears throat> you know, you see the first line. This is the first, this is the first time in, in history where I actually probably underexpended the substitute line. Because even if feel it, people were feeling a little bit poorly, you know, they could still do remote work at their at their house, and there wasn't the need for in-house substitutes. So that was a savings. We also had a shortage of custodians, which was kind of unfortunate, but with the $600 a week unemployment compensation that was going on, uh, it was real hard to find people who wanted to work as a custodian making six hundred dollars making less than six hundred dollars a week when they could collect unemployment and not have to uh, work at a job that's a custodian's uh, pay, which is a tough job. It's not easy being a custodian. they're they're responsible for around 22,000 square feet of building in every single building each and every day. And so it, it's it's a rough job. So, you know, that that's something that was an occurrence. Uh, the support staff salaries, we had a hard time filling the paraprofessional roles. And so we had a, a surplus of $450,000 there. You know, you look you look at athletics, well, if you're not playing sports, you know, you don't need coaching salaries and everything like that. So that was a $53,000 savings. Professional development, 
uh, took a hit because there weren't that many seminars to go to. Everybody just kind of shut down operations, and a lot of the PD um, opportunities that were there in the past were not there any longer through the end of um, June 30 of 2020. Transportation. We did indeed get a credit from our transportation company, STA, as a condition of getting money from the CARES Act. Um, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's, it's basically a COVID relief fund that the uh, Department of Ed established, and the Merrimack School District is in receipt of $392,000 for that. That's to cover planning, it's to cover technology, it's to cover personal protective equipment. It's a grant, so it's not in the budget, but it's in the grant side of things. So in order to be eligible for that, we had to honor all contracts that were previously signed, like the special ed, like the special ed contract, like the transportation contract. So even though, you know, we paid what we did to keep those drivers available, uh, we did get a, a fuel credit from Student Transportation of America of around $219,000. Now, you know, they weren't running routes to the end of, you know, to the end of the school year. But what they were doing is they were working with the lunch program to provide delivery service for meals that we were providing. You recall that in 2020 and all throughout the summer, but that's next fiscal year, uh, we were providing a bagged lunch for everybody who wanted to avail themselves of this. They would come in, they would drive into the high school, they would pick up. Those who could not pick up would call STA, our transportation company, and they would deliver the meals to people house to house. So that was a big bonus for us to utilize them in that fashion. And, you know, that was because we, we paid the contract, but we still got a refund, but we, we kept them afloat, so to speak, so they wouldn't have to lay off bus drivers. So that was an important thing to do, both in getting the CARES Act money and having their availability for absolutely positively anything we wanted through the end of, of June and during the summer of ne next fiscal year. Um, they were delivering packets to students. They were delivering, I think at one point in time, one of the, one of the elementary schools had 115 packets of instructional materials going home to students. So, you know, they had names, they had addresses, they had to develop routes in order to get these packets out to all the kids and everything like that. So it's like every single day they were working with the schools in both lunch distribution and both packet and educational material distribution, <clears throat> creating routes at a, a moment's notice and going out and doing deliveries. Uh, field trips, that's kind of an obvious, everything shut down. You're not going to the Courier Museum or going to Strawberry Bank or anything like that because everything was, was indeed shut down. Uh, I'll jump down to Driver's Ed. Driver's Ed was actually, the program shut down totally uh, mid-March because you couldn't keep uh, five feet of distance in a vehicle with Driver's Ed. Uh, even if you were masked up, the, the state just was not allowing it to happen. And, you know, unless you were driving, I think I said this at the board meeting, unless you were driving one of those H1 Hummers, and then you have a lot of, uh, you, have a lot of have, you have a lot of room between the driver and the instructor, but, you know, I don't think I want a kid taking driver's ed in one of those, and we don't have, you know, the driver ed school doesn't have those at their availability. So that program was basically shut down. <clears throat> The utilities, you see savings are on $185,000. That was basically because, you know, with no one in the schools and with limited staff coming and going, uh, we dialed back the thermostats on everything. Uh, we uh, shut the AC off in the, in the middle school for a long period of time. 
and uh, it's it's something that um, you know we did to save energy. We're not going to keep schools and facilities going full bore with a regular HVAC schedule um, if there's no one in there's no occupancy there. Now that has changed for next year, and we 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 changed that you know immediately because one of the recommendations of the Department of Health and Human Services was for air exchange. And the best way to get air exchange is to leave your HVAC systems running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so that's what we're doing now. So I would think that when we look at next year at this time, and when I'm in front of you, uh, as opposed to sitting home with my broken ankle, um, that uh, I will uh, be probably talking about an overage in that line based upon, you know, what we're, what we're looking at right here. Um, retirement workers comp, that's all wage driven. I'll get to that later. Equipment repairs, supplies, texts, uh, everything like that. That was just because, you know, there was there was not the need to order those supplies. And if we don't need the supplies, then we're just not going to order them to spend down our budget so it looks good for next year. You know, if we don't need it, we're not going to buy it. And if we're not going to buy it, it's going to go back to surplus to reduce taxes. So in essence, with, with COVID, <clears throat> we've got the, the, the red piece, which was the expenditure where there's no budget for it. And then we have the, the under expenditure and all those different categories, which was a direct result of COVID. Now, when we go down to the yellow section, uh, we had some, th this is all basically staff turnover. This year, the one that, that's glaring uh, really for 1920 is the professional staff. We had during that time, we have 344.6 teachers. Um, I think at some point in time, somebody mentioned a year or so ago, I'm not sure of the gentleman's name, but he put up a graph or a chart showing we had like 400 teachers. The correct number is 344.6, the record. And uh, with that, we had almost 40 teachers turnover either via retirements or just, you know, not willing to come to teach anymore during this period. So many of them found another profession or just moved on to another district or just went someplace else. But that was the highest rate of turnover we've had. And when you have that, you know, you've had, you had a particular demographic that was probably susceptible to COVID. They, 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 quite frankly, you know, they, they were scared. You know, everybody was. You know, when you get to a certain age group, and I'm in there, I'm in there myself, even though I don't look it, right, Chuck? Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I just have to put that in there. I, I apologize. No, if I was with true. you, you know, it's it'd be it's true. Yes, it would be much more humorous if I was with you. So <laughs> I'll try and keep things straight. But you know, that that's that. a big. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's a big concern. So there was a lot of turnover. So there was a lot of, you know, say, well, we lost a lot of good talent and, you know, this is a savings, but it, it's, it, it's a savings on paper. It's not really a, a savings as far as the educational value of the people that we did lose. However, you know, there is a bright side. You know, if you lose somebody who's making $70,000 and you hire somebody who's, you know, master's plus one, you're hiring them at, uh, you know, $42,000. So, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of change. And a lot of times you're talking about um, going from somebody with a family plan or a two-person plan, and we're seeing a lot of singles come in. And so there's a, a change in the demographic shift, which we'll talk about in the blue section. So that, that's basically why the savings in personnel. Then when you get down to the orange section, you know, special education, we had turnover in that area too. 
um, related services, uh, special services, uh, other related services, and tuition. Um, tuition was the was the big one because a lot of these facilities, uh, Crotchet Mountain closed down for a while because, you know, they were hit with, with, with COVID issues too. So there are a lot of facilities that we were tuitioning our kids out to that were no longer available to us. So I have I have to give great kudos to Heather Barker. I don't think you have met her. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, I don't recall. But she's our new special ed director when John stepped up to the assistant superintendency. And she has done one, I'm going to say, she has done one hell of a job with that department and trying to be creative and to still trying to provide to the best of our ability the services that kids need and to try and negotiate with certain vendors and contracts and going out to bid for special ed services and to get the best bang for the buck to try and fill in when we can. So I'm sure, you know, there are a few that feel that they didn't get the services that they really thought they required, but I think everybody got the services that were delineated in the IEPs according to the letter of the law in the IEPs. You know, maybe the delivery was different, something changed, but they, they had to do a lot of work to, to make that happen and to keep 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 the, the level of education to our our neediest learners at a level that was still relevant and meaningful to them. Now when I get down to the the blue section, you see we, we had budgeted for a retirement of someone um, who did not retire at that year. Um, and so there was a surplus in that area. The health and dental insurance is basically born on the back of the health insurance because of the, the shifting of the demographic, younger people coming in, maybe two-person family people leaving us, single plans coming in. You know, there was a, a shift in that, um, that, you know, there were a lot more people who were on single plans. There are people who took the site of service plan, which is the least expensive one, which is great if you're young and you're healthy and everything like that. You know, it doesn't cost you anything. It costs the district less. And, you know, you can keep money in your pocket because, you know, you're not susceptible to those those types of issues that come when, uh, you know, one gets, uh, you know, past their, you know, 50s or whatever, you know. So anyway, um, and then, you know, bonded debt. You know, people don't think that we actually go out and refinance or to use a, to use a term that everybody's familiar with. It's a lot more complicated than that. And refinance when interest rates drop low, but the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank does that for us and goes out and, and gets us a better rate. And they have been doing that for a number of years as interest rates have, have fallen. So that was a, a, a savings right there. <clears throat> you, so I'm going to skip over 21 for a second, but on item 30, transfer to capital reserve, that was a warrant article to take it from surplus. So that was, you know, executed and put into the trustee of trust funds hands before the end of June 30, 2020. That was uh, an expenditure to increase the amount in the emergency, uh, the maintenance emergency capital reserve repair fund. There's around close to $500,000 in there right now with the 150 that's going in there from uh, this fiscal year, 2021. And then the uh, school district uh, legal expenses. It wasn't the audit that cost us more, but it's bundled in there. Uh, we have around $55,000 budgeted for legal, and we spent around $38,000 more than we had budgeted uh, for a particular issue that was uh, 
addressed at the board level and in public session. It was just, you know, what we had to do uh, to uh, protect the interest of the districts from from lawsuits that were forthcoming because of certain situations that I won't get into at this point in time. Um, the revenue components, you know, we had a little bit extra in Medicaid, special education aid, and interest from investments. We, for years, had around probably three to four to five thousand dollars in interest. I think this year we probably had around fifty five thousand dollars in interest. It was basically brought upon by a way uh, a, a change in the way we do business we We do positive pay now, so what that means is every time we do a check run payroll and accounts payable, we have a file and we push it to t d bank so they know exactly the check numbers, the payees, the amounts, everything like that. So if you try, it's basically to prevent fraud because there's a whole heck of a lot going on as far as fraud goes. Um, we had a meeting with uh, Keith Pike. He's the vice president of government banking for TD Bank. And he explained the whole situation to us, how people can get exceedingly creative on this. And so we switched over to that kind of positive pay situation where we push out all our check numbers. So if somebody came into a bank and with the advent of, you know, printers and paper that you can buy, you can alter checks like you wouldn't believe and they look like the real thing. So if they created a different payee and they came in with a check number because the bank already had that file, it would bounce back and the teller would automatically take the check from the person, go in the back room, make a phone call, and then a supervisor would come out and say, we can't honor your check. And so because that saves TD Bank a lot of money because they're dealing with fraud on a large scale basis every single day, they pass that on to us. And so we realize an increase of around $50,000 in our interest on investments. Uh, we actually had a case where, you know how you can do remote deposit where you take a picture of your check and then you put it into your bank or credit union. Now, somebody tried to do that with uh, Santander Bank and they did a remote deposit and now they still have the paper check, but the bank, the check has gone into Santander. And so following day, they, they show up to St. Mary's Credit Union and they try and check, cash the check again. Well, TD Bank already knew it was cash. Boom, you know, it just went right St. Mary's. It just was communicated instantaneously to, to TD Bank. TD Bank denied it, and it's it saved, you know, probably around five six hundred dollars worth of of money that would have been, you know, gone. So that's the that's the whole premise behind that type of uh, program that we set up. It, it took us a good six months of implementation to do it but it was definitely absolutely positively worth it. And when I look at the, you know, food service revenues, you know what was going on there. Uh, we were providing meals for people. We were doing it. The board chose to approve that at no cost to anybody. And so we had approximately 300 meals we were doing every single day, but then the state applied for a waiver to the, um, Bureau of Nutrition in Washington, D.C., and they got a waiver so we could treat every single one of those meals as free, regardless of who it went to. And, you know, whoever picked it up and whether or not the need was there, because the, the free and reduced paperwork really didn't need to be filled out because, you know, people's situations changed exceedingly quickly. One day you've got a great job, everything like that and things are going terrific, and the next day you get a notice that, hey, you're taking a 20% pay cut, or hey, you're taking a two days furlough every single week, you know, you're not gonna be, you're gonna be making probably 40% of, of what you thought you were gonna be making, but you still really wouldn't qualify, but everybody knows that, you know, once you're making a certain level of income, you don't think that that's gonna go away, and so it put a lot of people in a bind and everybody was, um, 
extremely grateful, you know, for us doing that. But then, you know, the Bureau of Nutrition at uh, the state level was working with the feds in D.C., and they got us to treat that as a, um, a free meal and give us reimbursement at $3.50 a meal. So we still wound up the, the year with a, a fund balance of, of $50,000. So the rest of this is basically all the, the detail as you scroll. Oh, well, I'm scrolling. You're probably flipping papers, but I'm scrolling. And, uh, you know, it gives all the detail. There's a few things I want to touch up here because I noticed that there's a few missed postings, but I'll correct those as we, as we go forward. But when you wind up on page 20, you can see, you know, general fund budget was 76 million, 170. Uh, we spent 71,714, and there's the appropriation surplus of 4,456, which matches the total that's on the first page. You 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 can also see that we went we went over on on graduation expenses because of all the tent rentals and everything like that that we had to do, and special accommodations that we had to make. Graduation this past year looked very different than any other graduations we've, we've, we've ever had. So, you know, then you get into the general fund revenue. I'm not going to go over that. Matt? Uh, Matt? Yes, sir? Would, would you like to take a sip of water before you move on? I, if you would like me to, I, will, I have a <laughs> cup of coffee here. So, yeah, I will do that. <laughs> I, I know this is okay. your this is your bread and butter, Matt, and uh, we appreciate um, your thorough delivery. Um, it does take us a little bit more time to digest things, but uh, you oh yeah, I'm I'm sure. I, I you know, like I said, when when you live it and you've lived it for thirty years, you you can you can just sip through, and you have a tendency not to uh, take time. So oh, you've done there's, you've there's done a, a remarkable job thus far of being very clear and transparent yeah. about uh, uh, what the past year has looked like. So thank you very much for that. We'll yeah. be glad to move on to uh, the general fund. The, oh, the general fund in 2019-2020. What's that? Page 21. Yeah, page 21. Oh, general fund revenue? Yeah. Yeah, here we here we go. So <clears throat> you can see where the estimated revenues is seventy six thousand one seventy five oh five. That matches the amount of the general fund budget. And you can see where we had um tuitions that came in a little more than estimated. Uh, we actually got some state charter school aid, which I was really surprised surprised at. Um, the interest, as I said, we estimated 6,000. We got 56,000. Uh, student parking fees came in a little bit more, although we're not collecting those this year at all. That's something that's gonna change uh, rental of facilities is for outside groups. Uh, let's see, local unanticipated, that's just gifts and grants that come in that we're not anticipating. Uh, the state adequacy tax, that's really a misnomer. That, that's Merrimack money. That's not a, that's, that's not a aid kind of thing. That's a state tax. And then the, the, the real thing you want to pay attention to is the adequacy grant money. Um, you know, we estimated eight, eight million eight forty one. It came in exactly on the button because DRA gives us that number. You know, DRA gives us a number for building aid. They give it for, give it to us for the uh, state education grant. And then our current appropriation has to tie out with what's in the tax rate papers. 
We also estimated catastrophic aid at 747 311. There was a there, there was a lot of controversy revolving catastrophic aid. Um, I'm pleased that we got more than we had estimated. That was the lower amount that the Department of Revenue Administration allowed us to put down as an estimation. I wasn't quite sure we were going to hit that mark, but that's another thing where my office works with the special ed office. You know, this is all you know, paperwork that needs to be filed in with the state, and that's for any tuitions over three and a half times the state average. And sometimes it's funded at 100%, and sometimes state of New Hampshire doesn't have the money, so they arbitrarily decide to fund it at, like, 95%. There was one year where they were going to fund it at 70%. So it's always one of those, you kind of take the number that DRA gives you, you put it in an estimate, and you hope that you're going to hit it or go a little bit above it. Um, The state Medicaid distribution, that that was, we usually got in the past around, $300,000, $350,000 for Medicaid, but let let, let me me, uh, think about how I want to word this, but the, um, I'll just say it, but Governor Sununu uh, came out with an executive order, and this was to help us, and what he said was that you know, with Medicaid, usually the people who make the referrals are your school psychologists, your special ed, you know, coordinators at each building in conjunction with your special ed director. Uh, the people in the field who know the kids the best make the recommendations, and then therefore we get reimbursed for those services. So the governor said that no one who does not have a medical doctor's license can make a referral. So that just took, you know, Bob Walrath, who's been with us for 100 years, PhD, doctor of psychology, teaches at Riviera College. He's one of our, you know, providers. He's one of our school psychologists. He's an awesome individual and exceedingly knowledgeable he was stripped of, of being able to make referrals because he wasn't a medical doctor. So when I was talking to the state, you know, I said, well, what the heck? You, you, you just kind of cut the legs out from under us. You know, what, what do you think I should put in? Because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, in a quandary right now because, I'm thinking that, you know, to get a medical doctor to, who's not attuned or, you know, knowledgeable of all the special ed accommodations that need to be made to make a referral, I don't know if they're really going to want to do that. But, you know, this is something that we worked through and we found a service from a physician that would look over the recommendations from our people and would hence sign off on them. So that started off at the the end of the fiscal year, and that will continue along in 2021, but it's an added expense. So I don't think we'll ever see $300,000 again but we'll probably hit the $150,000 mark. But it was one of these things that everybody was kind of scratching their head saying, why is this? And, you know, me sometimes being a little bit, you know, cynical, um, you know, my thought was, well, saving the state money, right? So it's the old thing where you, you know, you balance the budget of the state off the back of the local property taxpayers. You know, that 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 theme has been around for I don't know how many years. 
And so this was, this seemed to be, you know, we're going to help you with this. And therefore, we're going to take away all your, all your ability to do any sort of referrals. And we're going to force you to go to a medical doctor to get those referrals. And this is going to make things better. Well, I didn't see it that way and nobody else did. But it just would have been better off if you just said, by the way, we don't want to pay you anymore. So this is what we're going to put you through. <laughs> but anyway, and then we have, you know, the federal unanticipated. This is, uh, you know, we, we get to charge um an overhead rate for administering federal grants that we get. And so this is something we're never quite sure what it's going to be. And so we don't really anticipate it. So hence the name unanticipated. It's like a, it, it's a cost of doing business that we have to administer federal grants. So that, that came in and we, we don't usually customarily budget for it on the revenue side because sometimes it's a lot, it, sometimes it can be, bigger than this, sometimes it could be a lot less than this. So, you know, you can see, even though it's a negative, when you're talking about revenues on a balance sheet accounting wise, revenues in the negative are, are always a good thing. So three, the 315,000 is a plus on the revenue side. We estimated 76,170, we got 76,486. And so we were to the good on the revenue side by three hundred thousand dollars. Let me uh, Matt, Matt, stop can, right there for a moment. Yeah, can I interrupt for just a moment? Apparently, uh, Carol Lang has a burning question. Oh, she does. Okay, it's not. Go ahead, Carol. It's not burning. It's just curiosity. Uh, fourth line from the bottom on page twenty-two, the fifty-two thousand five eighty-three with kindergarten aid. What happened with that? Yeah, that was that was um, you know because the, I think that that kindergarten aid more than likely should have been rolled into adequacy, but it came as a separate check because on the second or third year of having full day kindergarten, um, the kindergarten aid gets rolled into adequacy and it's counted there. But when the check came in, it said kindergarten aid. So we figured we we put it there just just to show it separately. Okay. Um, it's just an accounting thing. But yeah, I was surprised when I saw that, and I says, well, let me just we have a kindergarten aid thing because before when we started up full day kindergarten, we were getting a separate allotment for that, and. Um, this was, I think, in addition to, to what we got for adequacy, but it, it really should have been rolled into adequacy because it's based on the number of kids you have um, in kindergarten. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. At this point, uh, uh, Matt has covered uh, a substantial amount of material, um, and as we've broken for Carol's question, uh, I'd like to open it up for any other questions that uh, yeah, committee, committee members may have at this time um, that Matt, I'm sure, would be very happy to address. Absolutely. Oh, Carol would like to have one more. I always love Carol's questions, so go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Matt, I can't help being me. Um, no, that's fine. That's fine. You're you're a challenge, and I like that. Yeah. Okay, I gotta find it here. Okay, on page two, in your orange yeah. section. Yeah. What is the difference between SPED-related services and special services related? Uh, basically, one's one's. Um, One's in district, in house, and one is out of district. Number 22 is related services that happen outside of district that we provide at the provider's location. And the other one is the related services that we provide in house. Okay, great. That clears that up. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other uh, board, uh, excuse me, committee members that would uh, 
Uh, I'd like to ask Matt a question at this time. Seeing none, Matt, I'd be more than happy to uh, move on and have your, uh, your full explanation of the continuing material. <laughs> My full explanation. Okay. Well, I, I, we, we went through, um, you know, let, let, let's go on to food service. Where you get on page twenty-four, yeah, you can you can see that um, we underexpended the food service budget by one hundred eighty-four thousand dollars, and the majority of that is in the food and milk line, although there are salaries there. Uh, we did have we did have the food service workers that we had working doing the lunch the lunch plan out of the high school and everything like that. You know those those people were were awesome. They showed up every single day. We we paid them for it, but we did have some difficulty in finding you know other workers for other locations. But there wasn't anything really going on at those other locations at the time. Um, so we kind of left those positions vacant. The big thing is the food and milk because we were doing, we weren't doing the full lunch menu. Um, you know, the salad bars, bars, the a la carte, the full meals. You know, the the hot lunches. We weren't doing those because we just weren't set up because we were doing, you know, the bagged lunch kind of thing. You know, a turkey sandwich. I heard our chicken salad sandwiches were a real big hit. You know, people were saying, hey, you, you having chicken salad today? And we'd say, yes, we are. They they were really happy with that, you know, until it got to the fourth week of chicken salad and they got a little bit bored. So, you know, we, we I'm just I'm just kind of making a joke, but I remember I remember hearing that. So we 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 changed it up here and there. So. We provided, you know, a juice, um, a fruit, a fruit cup, a sandwich on a bulky roll or a gluten-free roll. We accommodated those who wanted, you know, gluten-free. And uh, we had ham and turkey and we had chicken salad. And when you're doing that, you're not, you're not expending as much money as it would have cost for a hot lunch program. So, you know, and then when you go down to the revenue thing, because we weren't charging anything for these meals, you can see that we, you know, didn't, didn't collect, you know, nearly as much revenue from the sales of food service because there were none, you know, from March on to the end of the year, it just wasn't there. We were, giving this away, but we did indeed get from the federal government around $300,000 worth of reimbursements to kind of make up the, uh, the, the shortfall on that. So, you know, you can see, you know, the revenues were underexpended. Uh, we have, um, you know, we had a, a lesser amount of um, revenue coming in, but we had the the, the, the money coming in from the federal government, plus we had the rollover from, from last year. So we wound up in, in a good spot. We were using, plus we were using a lot of the, the USDA commodities that we have. And it's not like the old days where the USDA commodities were, were something that uh, you, you know, hesitated to use. This is this is good. This is good stuff. I mean, they they had they had fresh vegetables. They had fresh everything. They had, you know, sliced meats. Everything like that. They've really stepped up their game. So there wasn't really anything lost there. So you know that that's why the uh, the underage in the <clears throat> food service sales and the underage in the um, the expenditures for food service. So that worked out okay. The food service fund is still solvent. And 
if there's any questions on that, I, I just, you know, page 25 and on, that's the first three months of the, the fiscal year. Um, and basically, you know, you, 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 you try and prorate this out, but a lot of it is, you know, when you're looking at heat, oil, electricity, everything like that, um, you know, you, you can't really do, a, okay, this is one quarter, let's multiply it times four, and that'll be the, the end of it, because it doesn't really work that way. So basically, that's the, the last sheet that I have to talk to, and I'd be willing to take any questions. You can see, you know, on page 30 for the first three months, uh, July, um, August, uh, September, there was virtually, you know, no substitutes at all because we would just, I think we started, we started late too. And so, you know, we're not going to have any expenditures as far as that goes, uh, with the exception of maybe some tutoring lines and whatnot. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's basically just to kind of give you an idea about, you know, where we're, where we're at after the first three months of the year, which from my experience, it doesn't give you a good picture of how you would expect everything to go towards the end of the year. But it is a snapshot in time, and that's basically what it is. Brian, that uh, waiver on the free lunch from the federal government, is that still in effect or was that only in effect during last fiscal? Um, it was, um, it's, it's still, it's, it's still, it's still in effect right now because, because in order for a school day, in order for a day to count as a full school day, we have to provide lunch to the remote students because um, we right now we're operating operating right now this instant at this point in time we're operating on a hybrid model where <clears throat> we have group a that goes monday tuesday we have group b that goes wednesday thursday and friday is a basically a flex day or remote day. So we have kids in school for two days a week, and then we have another group in school for two days a week. And that's because we want to basically decrease the amount of kids in the building by half to allow for social distancing. So a normal classroom at the high school, let's say you're, t you're talking a, a core course like um, English, you know, English 101 or something like that. You know, usually everybody has to take them, so there'd be 28 to 30 kids in there. You can't have that anymore because it doesn't allow classrooms 900 square feet. You don't have enough room to spread the desks apart or to X off desks like a lot of times you see in <clears throat> restaurants where they have little placards saying, you know, you can't sit here. Well, they don't say that you can't sit here. There'll be like a, a uh, like a, uh, a vase of flowers or something on the table, which means don't sit here. You have to sit at the next booth or table. So we have to have the number of kids coming into the building in order to provide that five feet of distance. And so for for in order for a day to count as a full school day, you have to serve lunch. So even with those remote kids, you have to serve lunch. So we're doing the bag lunches for those A and B kids who are now remote on Wednesday, on, two, on Wednesday and Thursday. So we are offering a bag lunch. So that program is still continuing. But the, the that's federal... A long, that's a long answer to a short question. I just should, should have said yes. The, but I wanted you to know the reason why. The federal waiver that is provide that was providing the reimbursements for that from federal funds, is that waiver still in effect? Are we still getting those reimbursements? Yes, it is, yes, yes, it is sir. Okay, and is that expiring in December with the rest of the CARES Act money? 
Excuse me, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't is, quite. Is that get waiver there. expiring in December uh, when a lot of the other CARES Act provisions expire? I, I don't want to guess at an answer, but if, if, if maybe Chuck could could restate that for me, seeing he's close uh, to the microphone. So a lot of the CARES Act money, or a lot of the CARES Act provisions are expiring in December. Is that waiver one of the provisions that's expiring in December? It is supposed to, but it'll probably keep going. If it does expire, will the district still be able to offer those lunches to those students? They have to, we will. Okay, and what about students who aren't officially on free or reduced lunch? We will do that too. Okay. Yeah, I think the board's made a commitment to do it. Um, I don't want to speak for them, but uh, yes, uh, that 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 is something we will do. You you have to offer it. You don't have to make sure everybody takes takes part in the program, but you have to offer it. And so we will continue to do that. Carol Lang. Yeah, here's where I'm going to be asking you to get out your crystal ball. Um, you, you always do this to me, Carol. Yes, yeah, I know. Go ahead. All right. I don't know if you even have any numbers in front of you for the month of October, but I'm realistically thinking September and October are the only months where school has been somewhat in session. And I'm wondering, are you seeing a large uptick compared to other years in the number of substitutes we have to use because of teachers being out sick, et cetera? The number of what that we have to use? Substitutes if teachers are out sick. That is a huge problem. <clears throat> the pro and and it, it's, it, it's exacerbated by the fact that we can't get them. And so there is a school board meeting going on right now discussing that amongst a lot of things. Um, there are a lot of teachers out because either they have been in close contact or they have family members who need their care and assistance under the FMLA Act who can't physically be here. And there is, you know, a big problem with trying to find substitutes right now. It, it's a big problem. Okay, and so it, it may cause it may cause us to to move in a, in another direction, and that's being discussed right now. Okay, so on one hand, you have the logistical problem of you can't find the people, but in a perfect world, if you could find the people, are you guessing we're needing twice as many substitutes as normal? Can you give me a ballpark idea of how big oh, a deal I would, is? I would def I would definitely say twice as many substitutes as, as normal. Yes. Okay, and then I guess my final concern on that issue, which is only tangentially related to the budget committee, but how is that impacting quality of education? Well, it 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 is uh, when you can't when you can't get the su I mean, you, you know who you know who our substitutes are? They're our principals and assistant principals. Wow, those are the ones who those are the yes. That happens on a daily basis right now. That's where we're at. And how is it affecting the quality of education? I, I can't venture a guess, but I don't. I don't think it is up to our prior standards. Let's not. Let's be realistic about this and, and not try and bury our heads. But uh, yeah, Adam Carragher, Sean Demore, Pete, Rich, um, Sharon. Every Kim, every single principal and assistant principal has acted as a substitute teacher in a classroom this year. And they don't get extra pay for it, I'm sure. No, of course, of course not. You know, I mean, you, 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 you're, you're a principal, assistant principal, your salary, you do what you have to do to get the job done, and that's what they're doing. Right. So at least express our gratitude to them for the service. Absolutely, I will. I will certainly do that, Carol. Thank, thank you for bringing that up because that is a big problem. Okay, that's the end of my question. Mm -hmm. Ellen Wilson, do you have a question? No, I'm good. 
Any other committee members with questions? So you're not willing to speculate, Matt, relative to the future, huh? Well, I, I, can, I can give you some things that we want to work with that uh, can. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to delve into the CIP because we're definitely we're, we're 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 working on that right now. I can say that one of the uh, one of the focuses of the capital improvement plan that you may or may not see in, like, let's say, potentially a Warren article, is to uh, increase some ventilation in classrooms. Um, maybe we're going to attack this like we attacked the asbestos problem, you know, over the years. You know, it takes 10 years and we finally get rid of a, a, asbestos in the schools that, you know, by law should have been done in 1984, but we did, we did it by, by like 2012. But, uh, you know, that, that could be something. Um, I'm, I'm working on the default budget right now, and we're putting together the bits and pieces. We do have $750,000 in increased aid from the state to spend on one-to-one -one computer devices for remote learning, to spend on connectivity, hotspots, to spend on cameras, anything to deal with technology that promotes online learning <clears throat> and uh, personal protective and sanitation equipment. So there is $750,000 there. But the $750,000 has to be spent by December 30th of 2020. Well, my, I'll just let that lay there and let it sink in. Uh, my my personal recommendation, Matt, was that you need to get busy on spending some of that money. <laughs> See, we, uh, the problem is 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 compounded by the fact that the DOE and they they say this is Congress in in D.C. Right? <clears throat> the if we went out. I could cut a purchase order for $750,000 worth of computers from Gov Connection, from PC Connection, from wherever that would be absolutely justifiable as far as uh, uh, an authorized expenditure of funds, but they have to be received and they have to be operational before December 30 of 2020. Now, when you have every single school district in the whole United States trying to get computers, you know, that's, that's the whole thing we went through earlier. It took us six, eight, ten weeks to get computers. Those aren't, it's not like the old days when you can say, hey, give me a thousand of these and, you know, within a couple of weeks they wind up on your doorstep. And now they, you have to make sure that they're operational. We don't have the tech staff to do that. So there are ways that we are looking at to make sure we fully take advantage of those funds and to make sure whatever we buy is up and operational before, before the new year hits. But it was kind of one of these things where, you know, you get a little foreshadowing of this happening at the end of October, you know, November, Seventh, the check came in, and then he got six weeks to spend it with Thanksgiving and Christmas in between. And it's supposed to be here, up, and operational. And I asked, I talked with, I'll, I'll, I'll drop a name. I'll, um, she works for, uh, what, uh, what, what's the commissioner of education? Yeah, Frank Edelblue's name, Frank Edelblue, the commissioner of education. And, um, She's basically his right-hand person as far as, you know, finance goes. And I said, Caitlin, do you really think that we can actually spend all this money and have it operational by, you know, December 30th of 2020? And she says, well, that's what the law says, and that's what Congress says, and unless there's a waiver, that's what the rule is going to be, and there it is. And so I said, well, what about licensing? Let's say we buy – 
you know, software licenses for a year or two, you know, something that we really need, you know, like uh, Envision's math. We buy an extra couple of years of, you know, that's an online math program. She says, no, we will only cover the part that goes from now until December 30th of 2020. So if we bought a software license that's in place up and operational because it will extend beyond that date, the rest of it's not going to count. So it'll only count like six weeks of a three-year software license. So there's, there's lots of um, interesting things going on right now that doesn't common sense wise just does not make sense to me but we'll work we'll work through it and we'll get it done one way or another we always seem to and uh, we're positive we're, we're going to get that uh, we're going to get that taken care of one way or another but it's something that's very concerning to me because I just don't I just don't feel it's right you know put a deadline out there of uh, you know next 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 June or something like that to give us a fighting chance but don't don't have an arbitrary deadline of the end of December 2020 with two holidays in between where nobody's going to be working anyway. I mean, we'll be working, but the people who are, you know, shipping and putting packing and getting all the components from China over here and getting them, you know, because everything comes from, you know, overseas. We don't make anything here anymore in this country. And so, you know, that that's going to be a real challenge. But we're 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 up to it. We'll we'll get it taken care of one way or another. Brian. Oop. Whoa. <laughs> Brian. So I've got uh, two questions for you, Matt. The first one on that, that uh, device grant, you mentioned one-to-one. -one. Does the grant have to be used to working towards that one-to-one -one ratio, or is it simply to support remote learning writ large? It's to, su it's to support remote learning. So we would like, you know, we have bought a lot of Chromebooks and a lot of laptops. But there's still quite a few, and I don't have that exact. I don't have the exact number so, to fill in. So, from a lot of the shortages, the most critical shortages right now that are pushing those delivery dates out six nine months, are on those uh, lower end devices that everybody's trying yeah. to snap up. Is it feasible right. to focus on maybe purchasing some? Uh, more middle market or even more expensive devices to be able to cover the neediest students in the district with the available grant money so that grant money can, in fact, be used to cover the neediest students first? Yes, exactly. That, that, that's, 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 one of our, that's one of the things that we're actually looking at right okay. now. You know, you got your bottom-end Chromebooks. Everybody wants to snap those up because it's a cheap way to get the one-to-one the -one. But, but the availability of them because of the demand is, is, just, is just not there. But if you're looking at a little bit higher end device that a kid could get in ninth grade and actually have it last for four years, you know, that's what we're kind of looking at and the availability of those. So we would definitely make the switch. And that's, that's uh, you know, beyond my scope of, of direct knowledge. I just know anecdotally ta talking with Nancy Rose, I know she's working every single angle she can in order to acquire devices, and that's one of the things we talked about. So okay. that, that's she'll have she has better information on that than I, but that's something we definitely talked about. But the focus is to making sure that the grant money gets used to get devices to the students who need them most. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And my other question was uh, circling back around to HVAC. Um, was there any need to upgrade filters in the district systems uh, for COVID precautions? Oh, HVAC? <clears throat> no. Actually, we looked at getting HEPA filters in our HVAC, HVAC uh, systems and putting those in. However, our HVAC systems, because of, I, you know, I'm going to quote a number and I'm probably wrong, but you know, the H, uh, HEPA filter is like 0 0.12 microns. And to put those in uh, the systems that we currently have in every single building, it would just choke off the HVAC system. So, our, so what we're doing is we're, we're replacing our filters. We used to replace them twice a year, 
we're going to go to like four times a year to replace them or even more than that. So are we on MERV 13 filters then? Do you know? Yes, correct. Okay. And was yep. that what we were was that what we were already using before or was that a change? Okay, could you could you restate that again? Was, I'm sorry. Was that already what the district was doing or was that a shift with COVID? Oh, no, that that shifted with COVID. We're 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 do we're doing it right now due to COVID at least four times a year. Okay, so then two follow-on questions to that. First of all, um, shifting to not just the, the more frequent changes, but both the more frequent changes and, if I understood correctly, we went from a lower filter up to the MERV 13. How is that impacting the budget right now? And then is that something that will be a long-term change or is that a temporary change until the COVID crisis has subsided? Well, I'm, I'm not quite, I know the MERV 13 filters, we talked about that with Honeywell. Um, you know, I, I think if, if we, if we do it because of COVID and it, it works, it works out, um, it may be our new standard because, you know, during cold and flu season, um, anything that we can do to, to help with that in the long run, even if it's not COVID related, which hopefully in a year or so, it won't be, will be something that we'll just put into our plan and just march forward with it. I don't think we'd go backwards. Okay. Do you have a rough ballpark of what the budgetary impact of that is? Nope. Tom's working on that budget right now. And we're working with Honeywell on what that would be. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other committee members? Matt, I would like to take this opportunity um, to express my personal opinion that the COVID episode that we are all experiencing has revealed a number of different weaknesses. And I know that, you know, we're all trying to do our best to meet the need of the students and so <coughs> forth. but. The world has now fundamentally changed. And while we had policies that we were working toward uh, relative to, for instance, one-on-one -on -one devices and so forth, it's very easy to see how, you know, uh, further reliance on that can, um, can be supported by uh, the need with uh, distance learning, remote learning. But there are a number of other uh, technology uh, weaknesses that have been revealed uh, in this process that I think also need to have some consideration, uh, probably not in the uh, grant money, but I think most surely uh, need to be included in a budget. Uh, we can't afford to drop any further behind than we already have. And that doesn't mean that we need to increase spending. It simply means that we have to understand what is before us. We are never going back to what it once was. And we, Absolutely. Need, and we, need, we need to rely more and more heavily on technology. <clears throat> and that's not just the delivery of information uh, uh, remotely to students. It has to do with, well, for instance, even how the budget committee operates. Um, we go back to things that we thought <coughs> sometime would be addressed in the community, like a new superintendency building that would have meeting space, that would have the technology portals and so forth to uh, conveniently um, support meetings such as the budget committee and any number of other committees in the school district and so forth. And we are not there. We don't know when we will be there. But there is an, an increased impetus to address these shortages in technology or we will simply never catch up. So if there needs to be some focus in the budget 
uh, relative to these otherwise uh, ancillary technology questions, then we need to plan for that and think about it. If if I could if I could comment on that too, certainly more. I, I I think that at this point in time, if COVID ends and we go back to the way we were, I think we failed. I think we need to learn from this. I think we need to go forward. I think you're right. I think this has this has illuminated a lot of things that we should have been taking care of years ago, but for you know budgetary constraints or. You know, I remember when I first got here, there was 56 K lines going into each school. And I got into an argument because I wanted to drop a T1 line into the high school and start to build a network. And in 2020, people were telling me, there's no need for a network. What's the matter with you? You're going to spend that money on a T1 line? T1 line? My God, our internet is, is faster in my home right now than a T1 line. So yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff that if we don't learn from this and if we don't if we don't present it in such a fashion that it's crystal clear the need for what you're talking about to this community for us to move into a, you know, I, I hate using this because it's almost it's almost sounds, you know, trite, a twenty first century learning environment. You know, this is this is the impetus for this. And if we don't grab this and ride it, we'll we'll never get there. We don't want to go back to the way we were before. We want to use this as a, a springboard to bring us to where we need to be. So I am I am in personally and I can I can probably speak for uh, my comrades in uh, central office, my coworkers in central office, my boss in central office. We are on the same page with you. Thank you, Matt. Any other committee yeah. members would like to uh, converse with Matt? Seeing none, uh, I'm going to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart, Matt, for that uh, thorough review of our circumstances to date. Um, always, a, always a pleasure, Mr. Moore. Uh, well, when can we pick up our budget books? Uh, um, let's see. Budget books are going to the school board on December 7th. So I would, uh, let's see. Hopefully we'll get everybody back in central office working. <laughs> so let me look at my calendar. December 7th is, uh, give us a couple days after December 7th and we should have them ready for you. <laughs> Fair enough, Matt. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Pat, do you uh, have a confirmed meeting schedule yet? The schedule that I gave you all last month is confirmed, except for the very first meeting, which is January 19th, because the school board is also scheduled a meeting on the 19th. And um, I am in negotiations with the superintendent as to which committee is going to meet on the 19th and which committee is going to meet on the 21st. So, but that will be the very first meeting where we review, uh, I think it's all the schools. Right. Their budget. So, okay. But the other dates are firm. Thank you so very much. So everything on that schedule is firm. I, I just, <laughs> Carol looked like she had a question. Yeah. I was hoping <laughs> if there was anyone else. Uh, Ellen, how, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Oh, excellent, okay. Um, and yes, uh, and shortly uh, we'll be handing out the uh, uh, liaison requests as well. Uh, the next item is public participation. They're all disguised as blue chairs. What, what's that? Yeah, they're all posted yeah. to the uh, school board meeting. No one's paying attention to us right now, I'm sure. Oh, there you go. That's I'm not so sure of that. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Um, committee member comments. 
Seeing none, I am looking for a motion to adjourn. Unless, unless Hang Ellen up. wanted to drop off. Yeah, yeah <laughs> tell Ellen to say goodbye. <laughs> well, we, we have we still have Ellen on the phone. Well, that's up to her. I'm still here. If she drops off, then we don't need say to goodbye. Call. Okay, Ellen, are you going? Oh, to... then you act like I'm not here. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Ellen. <laughs> All right, so we're through with that, and we're through with Matt. Great. Yeah. Hey, have Very a good. thank you, Matt. Have a good night. And a motion to adjourn. I would make a motion to adjourn. Seconded by Carol Lang. All those in favor? Thank you all very much. <laughs>